We examined our first forced journey back in 19th century Kabul with the British retreat through the dangerous defiles of Afghanistan in episode 11. We wrap up this group of five episodes with two forced marches that took place in different centuries and on different continents. The Trail of Tears in 1830s North America and the Death March of Bataan in 1940s Philippine Archipelago. Racism, hatred, and a ruthless behavior were present in both instances. In both cases, the defeated were completely surrounded and subject to the whims of their conquerors. In both cases, the defeated were dehumanized before they were mistreated. Manifest Destiny would also play an overarching role from the Atlantic coast of a newly independent America to the shores of occupied China. The Japanese felt they were destined to rule an empire that spread east, while the Americans felt they were destined to rule an empire that spread west. It was inevitable that these two empires would collide. And in this study, the Americans will be both victim and victimizer. <laughs> Greetings, kittens. Welcome to the Podcast of Doom, the podcast devoted to epic failure analysis. My name is David Appleson. Today we will examine two well-known forced marches, the Trail of Tears which saw American Indian tribes in the U.S. Southeast forced to march from their ancestral homes to undesirable lands west of the Mississippi River, and the March of Bataan which saw defeated American and Filipino prisoners of war forced to march 60 miles to Camp O'Donnell in the Philippines. In the first case, it was the U.S. Army overseeing the forced removal of Indians from their homelands to points further west. In the second case, it was the Japanese Army forcing the captured American and Filipino survivors of the Battle of Bataan to a distant POW camp. Both marches had their atrocities, and there was large-scale death and misery in both instances. The United States participated in both marches, in the first as aggressor forcing the march, and in the second as the defeated at the mercy of the victors. And although I promised in the introductory episode not to break up an episode, the wealth of material of these two forced marches necessitates a second part, which I promise I will deliver in a week's time. Beginning with the Trail of Tears, we will focus mainly on the Cherokee. That is not to say that only the Cherokee were forced to resettle. Other tribes that were neighbors of the Cherokee were also forced by the government to leave their homelands. They included members of the five so-called civilized nations, the Creek, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Seminole, and the Muskegee. It is a term that is offensive to all other indigenous nations because it suggests that they were not civilized. Most of this story will focus on the Cherokee, who were the largest of those five nations. The best theory of the origin of the Cherokee is that they migrated to the area known as Appalachia from land near the Great Lakes. By the time of white settlement in North America, the Cherokee Nation spread out through present-day states of Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Alabama, an area of 135,000 square miles or about the size of present-day Germany. The Cherokee culture had remained robust and full for centuries. They had agriculture, an organized religious faith with a priest class, and a structured society with recognized obligations and roles. The first Cherokee contact with Europeans was in May 1540, when the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soda passed through the Cherokee domain in the vicinity of East Tennessee and North Carolina. De Soto and his party were searching for gold following the successes of other Spanish explorers. The encounter was mostly friendly, but there is evidence that the Spanish infected the Cherokee and other tribes with diseases such as measles, smallpox, and chickenpox. These diseases caused a great number of deaths. There was little contact for the next century until French and British traders made contact with the Cherokee in the late 1600s. In exchange for fur and deerskin, the Europeans traded iron and steel tools, weapons, brass kettles, and farming implements as well as knives, 
guns, and bullets. It was also around this time that the Europeans introduced alcohol to the Cherokees in the form of whiskey. Some English traders married into the Cherokee community and established families. But further contact with Europeans meant further spread of European-born diseases. By the early 1700s, the Cherokee population had been cut in half as a result of death due to measles and smallpox. By 1730, tensions between the British and French affected the Cherokee, leading to an alliance between England and the Cherokee against the French. A treaty was drawn up and signed by seven Cherokee chiefs and King George II. Although most Indian tribes sided with the French, it was the British who would win the war. The British-Cherokee alliance did not last long. English settlers in the colonies, looking for new lands to farm, continued their encroachment upon Cherokee territory. A massacre of two dozen Cherokee took place in Virginia, and the Cherokee retaliated by attacking settlers in Virginia and North Carolina. The colonists retaliated back by burning Cherokee homes and towns. Retreating to the mountains, the Cherokee relinquished the lower lands to the settlers. When the Revolutionary War broke out, it had a profound effect on Indian settler relations. The Cherokee had been allies of the British against the French, but the Revolution split the British in America into two distinct camps, those who lived in America but supported the British crown, and the colonists who had been in America for years, or generations, and had been an expanding westward staking out claims on Indian land. The Cherokee allied with the crown, as the colonists had shown a complete lack of intent to honor their treaties. The British at least offered nominal protection. But that would end with their surrender to the colonists and their French allies. The British would honor the peace treaty they signed with the newly established United States of America and remove all of their troops from their former colonies. The withdrawal would leave the Indian tribes on their own against the encroachments of American settlers upon their lands. The idea that the United States of America was destined, perhaps divinely, to spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean began to take form. Less than 15 years after the Trail of Tears, the United States would continue to pursue this concept of manifest destiny. So many thousands of miles to the west that most Europeans considered it the Far East. In 1853, President Millard Fillmore commissioned Navy Commodore Matthew Perry to negotiate a trade treaty with Japan. As the Indians had learned, Americans had a very nuanced definition of negotiation. Perry led this trade mission at the head of four steam-powered warships. Prior to Perry's trade mission, Japan had been an isolationist country, limiting its contact with other cultures, strictly regulating trade and ignoring the rapid advances in military technology enjoyed by the Western nations. The U.S. had several reasons for desiring a trade treaty with Japan. First and foremost was their competition with the great European powers who had established trade treaties and their own communities in China and other na Asian nations. Also, the U.S. needed supply and maintenance depots for its fleet of merchant ships so that the ships could take on more coal and make needed repairs. Finally, there had been stories of mistreatment of shipwrecked American sailors who reached Japanese shores. Perry presented the treaty to the Japanese Takugawa Shogunate, the military establishment that ran the affairs of the country. Fillmore demanded an opening of trade relations between the two countries. And just to underscore the American position, Perry shelled some buildings in the harbor of Uraga. The Americans then left for a brief trip to China to give the Japanese some time to consider their limited options. Perry returned the next year to Japan with twice as many warships. The Japanese were well aware of what western warships could do to a coastal town from what they observed in neighboring China. In the convention of Kanagawa, the Japanese leadership accepted nearly all of the terms in Fillmore's treaty. It was an embarrassing moment in Japanese history, and it would result in the complete revamping of Japanese society. Up until the trade treaty, real power did not rest with the emperor but with the shogunate. Following the treaty and the treaties with other western powers that came, 
the Emperor made changes to align with Western technology and culture, while the Shoguns remained true to the old samurai code. The two sides fought against each other. In 1868, Emperor Meishi triumphed over the Shoguns using Western weaponry and tactics. So began the Meishi Restoration, which saw the Emperor regain his role as head of the nation and the initiation of a frantic period of rapid industrialization and the modernization of the economy and the military with the goal of catching up to the Western powers. The class society imposed by the samurai came to an end. Opportunities were made available to all members regardless of class. In 1873, Japan instituted military conscription for all 21-year-old males. Promotion was based on merit rather than family association. With the modernization of industry and agriculture, the population of Japan boomed. As in Europe, those in the countryside flocked to the cities to get factory work. Shogun lands were split up and separated. The samurai class was forbidden to wear their swords in public, and most were bought off with well-paying government jobs. At the same time, every male, including those in the peasant class, had the right to carry firearms. The emperor modernized the military too establishing a national army based on the Prussian model and a highly organized navy with an enormous fleet. While the new Japanese leadership destroyed the samurai class, they evoked the samurai spirit in their soldiers and sailors. The emperor sat at the head of the military and every member of the military was expected to show unquestioning loyalty to him and to his appointed officers. Because so much of the population was connected to the military, the Japanese tended to look toward the armed forces for answers rather than toward political bodies. Japan became a militarized society. In 1894, this revamped modern army made its first move against a foreign nation by attacking China in what came to be called the First Sino-Japanese War. The war ended one year later in a decisive Japanese victory. In humiliation, China ceded control of Korea, Formosa, which is now Taiwan, and Lo Ning Province. At the same time, Japanese intellectuals came up with the concept of the Line of Advantage and the slogan Fukoku Kyohei, which means enrich the country, strengthen the military. These intellectuals felt that if Japan did not project strength through its military, aggressive European nations would take advantage of her weaknesses. It also meant that Japan needed a defense perimeter beyond that of its islands to defend itself from foreign aggression. It would not be the first time or the last time in history the idea of a safe perimeter would be used to launch attacks. Part of this plan was put in place with the victory won in the Sino-Japanese War. The next part of the plan happened when Japan launched a war against the Russians. On February 8, 1904, Japan initiated a surprise attack on the Russian harbor of Port Arthur. The attack was a devastating blow to the Russian fleet, which was bottled up in the harbor. That initiated a short and bloody war that ended a year later with Russia's embarrassing defeat at the hands of the Japanese Navy. It marked the first time since the colonial age that an Asian nation defeated a European nation in full-scale war. Japan had now earned the respect of the dominant foreign powers. But more importantly, Japan was the dominant power in East Asia. Back in post-colonial America, following their victory in the Revolutionary War, the United States was now the dominant power on the eastern seaboard. Americans tended to treat the Indian tribes as conquered subjects since they backed the British in the war. Settlers migrating westward forced the indigenous peoples out of their ancestral lands. A burgeoning population and net immigration from Europe put ever greater pressure on opening up tribal lands to settlers and farmers. Because the United States was a new nation formed from 13 former colonies, state actions did not always conform to those of the federal government and frontier settlers did not always follow the laws of their states. During the Revolutionary War, the colonists burned down more than 50 Cherokee villages, slaughtered horses and cattle, burned crops, and killed many of the Cherokees as well as scalping some of the women. 
By the end of the war, many of the Cherokee had surrendered to the colonists. While most of the southern tribes sought a peaceful solution, the northern tribes fought back. On November 28, 1785, the first Treaty of Hopewell was signed between the U.S. government and the Cherokee Indians. The treaty set out a western boundary for American settlement. However, many Cherokee referred to it as talking leaves, meaning as soon as it suited the Americans, the terms of the treaty would blow away like leaves in the wind. The Cherokee also complained that 3,000 settlers in the de facto state of Franklin were already squatting on Cherokee lands. The treaty gave Indians the right to remove white settlers on their lands, but there was no mechanism for enforcement of this allowance. Georgia and North Carolina claimed the federal government did not have the authority to hand over land in their states. When the U.S. Constitution was drafted in 1787, it gave the President and Congress authority over Indian affairs and trade. President George Washington assigned this task to his Secretary of War, Henry Knox. By handing the task to the Secretary of War, Washington indicated his views on Indian rights to their land. However, within a few months, Knox laid out a plan to stop the fighting and protect the Indian tribes as sovereign, independent states. He called the intrusion of settlers onto Indian lands disgraceful. The Indians, being the prior occupants, possess the right to soil. It cannot be taken from them unless by their free consent. To dispossess them would be a gross violation of the fundamental laws of nature, and of that justice, which is the glory of a nation. Knox negotiated with the Cherokee that they would be paid for the land taken away from them, and the U.S. would forbid further intrusion onto their lands. But Knox also said that civilized and uncivilized people could never successfully live together. The uncivilized people would always be doomed. This concept of compulsory assimilation was actually the liberal view at the time for white Americans compared to the more prevalent view of conquest and extermination. The 1791 Treaty of Holston actually defines civilized. That the Cherokee Nation may be led to a great degree of civilization and to become herdsmen and cultivators, instead of remaining in a state of hunters, the United States will from time to time furnish useful implements of farming, and further assist the said nation. The U.S. government sent the Cherokee plows, hoes, spinning wheels, and cotton seeds. The Cherokee were taught new skills by experienced blacksmiths, millers, and spinners. Many of the Cherokee picked up on these trades quickly and became successful smiths, spinners, store owners, and plantation owners. Some even purchased African-American slaves to work their plantations. While the Cherokee were being civilized, the U.S. government continually negotiated new treaties that gave more Cherokee land to the U.S. White traders on Cherokee land willingly extended credit to Indians, and when they defaulted, accepted land in return for the cancellation of debt. When Thomas Jefferson became president in 1801, he continued Knox's policies, but he also wanted more land from the Indians. The next year, he signed the Trade and Intercourse Act, promoting civilization among the friendly tribes and furnishing them with domestic animals and farming implements. Jefferson was hoping that in return, the Indians would use less of their land for hunting and take up farming. But Jefferson was disappointed when that didn't happen. In the Compact of 1802, he made a deal with the state of Georgia in which he promised to eliminate Cherokee land titles in Georgia and remove the Cherokee from that state. Later, he broadened the agreement so that all Indians would be relocated to lands west of the Mississippi River. The recent completion of the Louisiana Purchase Treaty gave him the authority for the relocation. However, the purchase did not recognize the rights of the people already living on the land. In 1821, a Cherokee silversmith named Sequoia developed a written version of the Cherokee language. The language was based on 85 symbols, and many Cherokees quickly learned how to read and write in the language. Sequoia's language also facilitated the learning of written English by Cherokees. Today, many indigenous nations have developed their own written languages. Using this written language, the Cherokee wrote their own constitution in 1827. 
Like the U.S. Constitution, it created judicial, executive, and legislative branches of government. It defined the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation and forbade Cherokees from selling their lands. Anyone moving outside of Cherokee lands was stripped of citizenship. In 1828, John Ross was elected the principal chief of the Cherokee. In 1827, the Georgia legislature declared, The lands in question belong to Georgia. She must and she will have them. In 1828, Andrew Jackson ran for president and won on a platform that included the removal of all Indians from the southern states. Jackson swept all of the states in the south and west. Following the election, the Georgia legislature passed laws that stripped the Cherokee of most of their rights. The next year, Chief John Ross led a delegation of Cherokees to address Congress. Ross won the support of some senators, but Jackson claimed that Georgia had the right to pass all laws affecting Cherokees in their state. Opponents of Jackson, including Congressman David Davy Crockett, argued the Cherokee were a civilized people and were therefore entitled to their rights. Gold was discovered in Georgia in 1829, setting off a mad rush of thousands of miners into the state. The prospectors, called 29ers, dug for gold without any regard for property rights. Tension mounted between the Cherokee and the miners, resulting in violent conflict. Greatly outnumbered, the Cherokee were repeatedly defeated and pushed further off their lands. Later that year, the Georgia governor declared that all Cherokee land within the state boundaries belonged to the state of Georgia. In 1830, a bill called the Indian Removal Act was introduced into Congress. Former Georgia Governor John Forsyth said in support of the bill that the state of Georgia should never have to submit to the intrusive sovereignty of a petty tribe of Indians. He called the Indians a useless and burdensome people and a race not admitted to be equal. The bill passed by a narrow margin and President Jackson signed it into law. The law allowed Jackson to give unsettled land west of the Mississippi to the Indians in exchange for the highly desirable land east of the river. Although the act made no allowances for the Indian tribes already living west of the Mississippi. Georgia then passed a law prohibiting Indians from mining for gold or from meeting for political purposes. In reaction to these laws, Principal Chief John Ross hired attorney William Wirt and filed suit in the U.S. Supreme Court against the state in the case Cherokee Nation v. Georgia. The lawsuit claimed that the state of Georgia did not have jurisdiction over the Cherokee because they were an independent nation. The suit asked the court to strike down all Georgia laws concerning the Cherokee. Under Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, the court declined to hear the case, stating that the framers of the Constitution did not really consider the Indian tribes independent nations, but rather dependent domestic nations under the jurisdiction of the states. Marshall concluded that the Supreme Court lacked jurisdiction over such a case. The determination was a double blow to Indians. Not only was their suit thrown out, the U.S. Supreme Court defined all Indian tribes as dependent nations subject to the laws of the states in which they resided. As a result, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Creeks agreed to being relocated to the new Indian territories west of the Mississippi. Still, the Cherokee held out. Georgia passed another law, this one requiring whites living among the Cherokee to obtain licenses of residency and to take an oath of loyalty to the state. Eleven missionaries working for the Cherokee refused to comply with the law, claiming that the state had no authority over the Cherokee nation. The missionaries were arrested. Nine of them agreed to abide by the law, but Samuel Worcester and Eliza Butler held out. These two missionaries were tried, convicted, and sentenced to four years of hard labor in a Georgia prison. Worcester and Butler hired Wirt, and the case Worcester v. Georgia was brought before the Supreme Court. This is a good time to mention that Chief Justice Marshall was basically the founder of the modern U.S. Supreme Court. He made the court equal in power to the President and to Congress. 
He expanded the powers of the federal government, and he established that federal law superseded state law. He was the longest-serving chief justice, and his decisions carried great authority and influence. In Worcester v. Georgia, Marshall concluded, The Cherokee Nation, then, is a distinct community, occupying its own territory, in which the laws of Georgia can have no force. It was a complete 180-degree turn from the Cherokee Nation decision. The Cherokee were a sovereign nation. The laws of Georgia violated treaties signed between the Cherokee Nation and the U.S. government. The arrest and conviction of Worcester violated U.S. law and the authority of the president. Individual states had no authority over Indian affairs. Victory was at hand. However, there was only one small fly in that vast kettle of ointment. The court had no mechanism for enforcing the decision. It relied on the office of the president to do that. In response to the court's ruling, President Jackson stated, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Marshall's decision imposed no obligation on the president. The court did not ask federal marshals to impose the ruling on the state of Georgia, as was the custom at that time. Jackson took no action and said the court had no authority to coerce the state to yield to its decision. Worcester and Butler were eventually pardoned, and in return they never went back to Cherokee lands. The Cherokee were a sovereign nation. Mr. President, feel free to forcibly remove them from their land. Returning to 20th century Asia, the Japanese were enforcing their will on several sovereign nations. Japan now had a presence in Manchuria, Korea, Taiwan, and some former Russian islands. They had officially joined the Imperial Powers Club. The other Imperial Powers invited Japan to help it quell the embarrassing Boxer Rebellion, in which the Chinese had the gall to demand they control their own internal affairs. Japan was part of the eight-member alliance that put an end to that. The unequal treaties they had signed with the West were removed and Japan was treated as an equal by those nations. In 1902, Japan signed an alliance with the British, who were at the time competing against the Russians for influence. Remember back to the great game from episode 11? The alliance came in handy during the Russo-Japanese War, when through some tricky politics it meant the French could not aid the Russians. The alliance also meant that the Japanese would enter into World War I on the side of the Allies. The Japanese were not heavily involved in the First World War, but they did defeat the Germans at Qingdao, and they aided British shipping in the Mediterranean. As a result of being on the winning side, Japan was granted Germany's possessions in the Pacific. That included the Marshall Islands, the Carolines, the Marianas, and the Chinese port of Jiaozhou Bay. The Japanese-Anglo alliance was terminated by the British in 1921. The Japanese war in China never quite went down that well in the United States, who feared an overly aggressive Japan intervening in their colonial affairs in the Pacific. The Japanese victory over Russia in 1905 did not allay those fears. Feeling that they had to choose sides, the British backed the Americans and the alliance with Japan was dissolved. In 1926, Emperor Showa assumed the throne. Those of us outside of Japan will recognize him as Hirohito, and he was the grandson of Mishe. He would rule for 63 years until his death in 1989. During the early years of his reign, democracy would move in fits and starts. When the global depression of the 1920s and 30s came, the military slowly pushed the parliament aside. Like Germany, Italy, Spain, and many other nations in Europe at that time, Japan was turning to fascism. And like Mussolini, Hitler, and Franco, Japan had a ready father figure at hand in the form of Hirohito. The competing political parties voluntarily rolled themselves into just one party, the Imperial Rule Assistance Association, making it all that much easier for the emperor and his military chums to run things. What followed was the Manchurian Incident, a staged event 
put together by rogue members of the Japanese military. In 1931, these rogue elements detonated some explosives next to the Japanese railway line in Manchuria, China. The explosion was so weak that minutes later a train passed over the targeted tracks without incident. But Japanese military leaders claimed it was the work of Chinese dissidents. Japan responded with a full-scale invasion of Manchuria. Pretext fulfilled. The invasion sparked outrage around the world. It was also around this time that Japan submitted to the League of Nations for approval the Racial Equality Clause. Simply put, the clause would have added an amendment to the League of Nations Charter stating that all peoples should be treated just and equally regardless of race or nationality. The Japanese were mainly concerned about their treatment, but the clause had wide implications for nations with racial minorities who were treated unequally. Although the amendment passed by a majority of nations, Great Britain, Australia, and the United States, countries with obvious racial inequalities, made certain it did not get ratified. Due to the efforts by the United States to defeat the clause, relations between the U.S. and Japan continued to deteriorate. Further compounding problems was the U.S. passage of the Immigration Act of 1924, which, among other things, banned immigration to the United States of any person emigrating from Asia. The law was highly racist in its composition, limiting immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe as well. For the next several years, Japan and China fought minor battles and skirmishes, mostly in northern China. On the night of July 7, 1937, one of these minor skirmishes got out of hand. The Marco Polo Bridge incident, as we now know it, turned into a full-scale battle that eventually led to Beijing and Tianjin falling under Japanese control and occupation. There are many historians who consider this incident the true start of World War II and not the German invasion of Poland in September 1939. This second Sino-Japanese war was particularly bloody as the Chinese did better than expected against Japan's modernized army. That forced Japan to send an even greater number of troops to China. Eventually, Japan captured the capital, Nanjing, in December of 1937. In the rape or massacre of Nanjing, take your pick. Japanese soldiers killed hundreds of thousands of Chinese civilians and disarmed Chinese soldiers. Thousands of Chinese women were raped and looting was rampant. The Japanese now held most of coastal China. In September 1940, Japan joined the Axis Pact with Germany and Italy, promising mutual defense should any of the three nations go to war. That same month, Japan invaded and occupied French Indochina, the modern nations of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. The United States was already supplying China, Japan's enemy, with money, supplies, and military experts. Following the invasion of Indochina, the United States and Britain began an embargo of petroleum and iron products against Japan. It was a crippling move for Japan, which lacked the natural resources to produce these items within its own borders. Japan's options were limited. They could do nothing and watch all of their military conquests and their army and navy collapse, not to mention the damage to their own country, due to a lack of resources. Or they could attack American, British, and Dutch interests in the Pacific Ocean and regain access to the resources they so badly needed. After the Worcester v. Georgia decision, many Cherokees decided to take up a government offer to relocate further west to Arkansas. But those who did found that the government promises of food and supplies were just empty gestures, and many of them died during the journey. They wrote to their relatives still living on Cherokee land not to come out west. Another series of government incentives to relocate followed. In 1832, Cherokee representatives met with Congressman Elijah Chester. Chester offered a treaty that included new lands west of the Mississippi if the Cherokee would relocate there. He argued that leaving Georgia was better than living under a hostile state government. The treaty was refused, but it had the effect of splitting the Cherokee into two camps. Those willing to relocate, the treaty party, and those who refused to move under any circumstances, the Nationalist Party. 
Later that year, President Jackson offered the Cherokee $3 million to move. John Ross refused, but he was criticized by the treaty party leader, John Ridge, for not accepting the offer. In 1834, a group of 500 Cherokee left on flatboats for the Western Territories. Along the way, trading posts jacked up the cost of food, supplies, and alcohol. There was an outbreak of measles during the trip, causing 81 members of the party to perish. In 1835, a group of more than 80 Cherokee met with federal officials in New Ecote, Georgia. John Ross refused to attend. Twenty Cherokee would end up signing the Treaty of New Ecote, agreeing to the total removal of Cherokee people from Georgia in return for lands further west and compensation of $5 million. For the Cherokee, there was disagreement over the legitimacy of the treaty, but for the United States government and the state of Georgia, it was a binding agreement. The deadline for relocation was May 23, 1838. Ross told the tribe to ignore the treaty. In this atmosphere of confusion, more than 2,000 Cherokee voluntarily relocated to land in present-day Oklahoma. For many, it seemed the writing was on the wall, and it was wisest to relocate under the best terms possible. But the majority of Cherokee refused to move. On May 10, 1838, General Winfield Scott set up his headquarters in New Ecote and issued the following proclamation. Cherokee, the President of the United States, has sent me with a powerful army to cause you, in obedience of the Treaty of 1835, to join that part of your people on the other side of the Mississippi. I am an old warrior and have been present at many a scene of slaughter, but spare me, I beseech you, the horror of witnessing the destruction of the Cherokee. Do not wait for the close approach of the troops, but make such preparations as you can. The day of the deadline, Ross tried to convince the government not to follow through on the removal. But three days later, General Scott ordered 7,000 troops to begin preparations. Their first task was to build stockades that would serve as prisons, a holding place until an escort could be provided for the journey to the Indian territories. In reality, the stockades were nothing more than concentration camps. When the 23 stockades were complete, some of the Cherokee left their homes voluntarily to avoid violent confrontation. With the stockades in place, the soldiers entered the Cherokee lands and forcibly removed the Indians wherever they found them, allowing them no time to collect their personal belongings, food supplies, or mementos. The Cherokee were taken from their fields and from their dinner tables without warning. Soldiers used bayonets and the butts of their guns to force the Cherokee out. White scavengers broke into homes as soon as they were vacated to steal heirlooms, jewelry, and other valuables, as well as their horses, cattle, and sheep. There were many Cherokee who chose to flee. Those apprehended were shot on the spot. One missionary who lived with the Cherokee described the events this way. We were disturbed by the arrival of a company of soldiers with 200 poor prisoners. Indians soaked through by the rain, whom they drove through the Chickamauga River like cattle. It was pitiful to see the poor folks, many old and sick, many little children, many with heavy packs on their backs and all utterly exhausted. In the confusion, some had left behind their children, who chanced not to be at home. Other children had run away from their parents in terror. Once all the Cherokee were moved, they were placed in the stockades until they were overflowing. Conditions there were harsh and inhumane. The stockades were built with split logs more than 15 feet high and sharpened at the top. Those detained there had no cooking implements or fuel to build fires. The drinking water was dirty and caused dysentery. There was no privacy. All affairs were conducted out in the open. People were forced to sleep on the ground exposed to the elements. Without a roof or any shelter, they were subjected to the burning summer sun as well as soaking rain. Hundreds died from illness, starvation, and exposure. Daily food rations consisted of flour and raw pork. Without a source of heat for cooking, many became sick from eating the pork. Local traders sold whiskey to the Indians in the stockades, contributing to violence and other problems. Approximately 16,000 Cherokee were placed in the stockades, 
and the crowding contributed to death by diseases such as measles and whooping cough. On the day of December 8, 1941, Japan launched a multi-prong attack against the colonial empires that threatened her supplies of precious resources, namely oil and coal. One part of the attack was launched against Hong Kong, another against Singapore, a third against Malaya, another against Guam, and on the other side of the international timeline, where it was still December 7th, they launched a major attack against the home base for the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt would call it the day that would live in infamy. On that day, the Japanese also attacked the U.S. colonial possession of the Philippines. It was their plan to use the Philippines as a launching point for yet another attack against the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia. Some of the senior defense ministers in the Japanese military warned that a war against the United States would mean quick victories for the Japanese in the first six months, but then devastating defeat once the U.S. was up to full industrial war production. Those predictions would turn out to be remarkably accurate. The attack on Pearl Harbor caught the American defenders completely by surprise. The air attack crippled eight U.S. battleships, three cruisers, three destroyers, 188 aircraft, and killed 2,403 Americans. It was a devastating blow for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. In Singapore, the British and their allies were even more surprised. They found themselves surrounded, and the Japanese took 80,000 soldiers prisoner, the largest capitulation in British history. In Malaya, they killed 5,000 British and Allied troops and captured 40,000 prisoners. In Hong Kong, they killed 2,000 defenders and took 10,000 prisoners. All were surprise attacks. The Japanese had not formally declared war against the United States or Great Britain. Six to seven hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor began, Japanese planes were bombing Clark Field, Nichols Field, and Iba Field in the Philippines. Many of the American planes were destroyed while sitting out in the open. Within the first day, the Japanese had gained full air superiority. That is, complete control of the skies over all of the Philippines. The United States was forced to withdraw all of its surface ships from the area in order to preserve what remained of the fleet. U.S. air and submarine attacks were unable to prevent the Japanese from landing on the beaches of the Philippines and seizing the airfields of Bataan Island, Apari, and Vigan City. Within three days, the Japanese had complete control of the seas as well as the skies. On December 22nd, the main land-based assault took place at Lingayen Gulf. The American beach defenses were completely overrun and the surviving defenders were forced to further retreat inland. With his beachhead defense plans in ruins, Supreme Commander General Douglas MacArthur implemented War Plan Orange No. 3, which called for a pullback and defense of Corregidor Island and the Bataan Peninsula. MacArthur's great plan was to hold those areas for six months in the hope that a relief fleet would arrive and retake the islands. However, due to the sudden Japanese victories and withdrawal of surface ships, the Americans lacked sufficient supplies for a six-month holdout. MacArthur and the Filipino president were evacuated to Corregidor, while the capital Manila was declared an open city or an undefended city. The Japanese captured it on January 2, 1942. MacArthur established a series of defensive lines intended to slow the advance of the Japanese army. The defenders were both American and Filipino. The American equipment was old and outdated, while the Filipinos lacked military uniforms and sufficient weaponry. Still, they fought hard and bravely, inflicting heavy casualties against Japan's modernized forces. The Allies fought tenaciously. Navy shore patrols and Army Air Corpsmen were pressed into duty as ground forces. They were led by 120 Marines from an anti-aircraft battery. MacArthur withdrew again to Australia where he made his famous I Shall Return radio broadcast to the Filipinos. By April, the Japanese had brought in heavy artillery and bombers, pounding the American forces in their defense works. Finally, Japanese tanks and infantry managed to surround the surviving Allied forces. 
Commanders had lost all contact with their units except by runners. As military units disintegrated, the roads became clogged with refugees and fleeing soldiers. On the morning of April 9, 1942, the senior U.S. commander on Bataan, Major General Edward King, surrendered to Japanese Major General Komarichio Nagano. Almost completely out of supplies, the surviving American and Filipino fighters were starving and emaciated. In a famous radio broadcast on Voice of America Radio, Lieutenant Salvador Lopez wrote the script and Lieutenant Norman Reyes read the text from within the Malinta Tunnel in Corregidor. Bataan has fallen. The Philippine-American troops on this war-ravaged and blood-stained peninsula have laid down their arms. With heads bloodied but unbowed, they have yielded to the superior force and numbers of the enemy. The world will long remember the epic struggle that Filipino and American soldiers put up in the jungle fastness and along the rugged coast of Bataan. They have stood up uncomplaining under the constant and grueling fire of the enemy for more than three months. Besieged on land and blockaded by sea, cut off from all sources of help in the Philippines and in America. The intrepid fighters have done all that human endurance could bear. But the decision had to come. Men fighting under the banner of unshakable faith are made of something more than flesh, but they are not made of impervious steel. The flesh must yield at last, endurance melts away, and the end of the battle must come. Bataan has fallen, but the spirit that made it stand, a beacon to all the liberty-loving peoples of the world, cannot fall. A month later, the island of Corregidor would fall. On June 6, 1838, the relocation of the Cherokees began. Taken from their stockades, 3,000 of them were loaded onto flatboats at Ross's Landing on the Tennessee River. The flatboats were tied to a steamer that would pull them downriver. The boats were filled beyond any reasonable capacity. Missionary Daniel Buttrick noted the Cherokee were literally crammed into the boat so that the timbers began to crack and give way and the boat itself was on the point of sinking. A long summer drought made water travel difficult, and often the Indians were put on wagons before resuming travel by boat. It took several days to make the journey to eastern Oklahoma. In July, Chief John Ross returned to New Akota. There he found burnt homes and crops as well as stray cattle and sheep. He was horrified by the conditions in the stockades. He immediately ordered inspections of the camps and enforced a ban on alcohol. Ross was able to postpone further migrations until after the heat of summer had passed. General Scott agreed to put Ross in charge of the relocation. The Cherokee were broken up into groups, each with a leader. U.S. soldiers would act only as observers and the U.S. government would give aid and supply. Former President Andrew Jackson was outraged by these new terms, but Ross remained in charge. With General Scott's help, he brought in more wagons, horses, and oxen. In October, a group of 1,100 Cherokee began their journey west. The people in the procession were still extremely weak from hunger and disease, but most were forced to walk without proper clothing or shoes. Along the way, private landowners forced the travelers to pay an exorbitant toll to pass across their lands. When they needed to buy supplies, traders charged double or triple the normal price. The cost of ferry passage was raised and the Indians were charged to pay for the burial of their dead. Campsites were set up in advance by Ross, but not all of the travelers made it that far by nightfall. Many were forced to sleep out in the open. As the seasons progressed, snow and rain set in. Wagon wheels got stuck in the mud, slowing the party's progress. Many of the Cherokee were dying from exposure, hunger, disease, and exhaustion. The entire route was 826 miles long, passing through several states and crossing numerous rivers. But the route changed for successive parties as game hunted for food was depleted in those areas. Often they had to make camp in howling wind, torrential rain, brutal cold, or heavy snow. Measles, whooping cough, dysentery from dirty drinking water, and respiratory infection were widespread. The last group of Cherokees left Ross's Landing in December. They were the oldest and the frailest of the group. During this final journey, 
Chief Ross's wife, Quaity, died, and he buried her in the frozen ground of Arkansas. It is difficult to determine the total number of Cherokee who died on the Trail of Tears, but based on the figure of 16,000 put into the stockades in Georgia, 4,000, or one quarter, would be a conservative estimate based on the records and accounts from that time. The Cherokee called it Nuna da Ula Juyi, or the trail where we cried. It was a dark time in America's treatment of its own people. Returning to the Pacific Theater, the Japanese were unprepared for such a massive number of prisoners. The Japanese army captured more than 78,000 combatants, of which 12,000 were American and more than 66,000 were Filipino. The Japanese were expecting the siege to last one more month. They had made no preparations for transporting or housing a large contingent of prisoners. The samurai code, which was still loyally followed by imperial Japanese soldiers, expected a warrior to fight to the death or commit suicide rather than surrender. This may have played a part in how Japanese soldiers viewed prisoners of war. Instead, the Imperial Army was faced with the prospect of removing all of their enemy prisoners from the battlefields before commencing their attack on Corregidor. They refused to spare any vehicles that they planned to use for the attack, and there were few available railroad lines. The relocation of the prisoners of war, or POWs, would take place in three phases. The first was a 31-mile march from Mari Leaves through Balanga, the capital of Bataan, and then on to San Fernando. The second phase was a 25-mile journey by rail to the city of Capas, and the final leg was a 9-mile march to Camp O'Donnell, the former Philippine Army barracks now in Japanese hands. Captured soldiers were forced to hand over their valuables to the Japanese, who then ordered the POWs to carry their field packs. The packs were loaded down with ammunition and weaponry and often weighed more than 70 pounds. To the POWs, who were already suffering from malnutrition, thirst, and exhaustion, this must have seemed like a perverse form of torture. Those who struggled were gouged with bayonets, and those who collapsed were beaten. One of the first actions of the Japanese was to separate the white Americans from the Filipinos. Once separate, the Japanese summarily executed between 350 and 400 Filipino officers. This after their efforts to pass the Racial Equality Clause and the uproar over the Immigration Act of 1924. Racism would rear its ugly head on both sides. The first part of their trip was from the town of Marylees to Balanga. The prisoners were separated into groups of 100 and a contingent of guards was assigned to each group. Without supplies of food or water, many of the prisoners perished along the way from exposure to heat, starvation, or thirst. Those who fell were subjected to beatings and stabbings. Many were run over by trucks or tanks, often more than once. When they arrived at Balanga, there was no hospital or medical aid provided by the Japanese. U.S. medical personnel tended to the injured and sick prisoners with few supplies available. Conditions were crowded and the sanitation inadequate. Dysentery and other diseases were common. Those who were fortunate received a cup of water and one portion of rice per day. After the majority of prisoners had been collected at Balanga, they were then forced to walk to the city of Orani. For the first three days of the march, there was no food and although there was clean drinking water in artesian wells along the route, the Japanese shot any man who attempted to drink from these wells. Instead, they were forced to drink from dirty buffalo wallows found along the side of the road. Often for practice, the Japanese would behead random prisoners with their samurai swords. Many Filipino civilians who attempted to help the struggling POWs were shot dead. For rest, sometimes the guards forced the prisoners to sit in the hot tropical sun. They called this the sun treatment. The next leg of the march to Lubao was 15 miles. At Lubao, the prisoners were housed in an abandoned warehouse with one water spigot and no sanitation. Corpses and raw sewage were left uncovered. The next day, they continued from Lubao to San Fernando, a trip of 8 miles. Due to their weakened condition, this may have been the most difficult portion of the journey, and many men died along the way. 
From San Fernando, they traveled by rail car to Capas. Each boxcar was packed with more than 100 prisoners. The boxcars were unventilated and were sweltering in the midday heat. More prisoners died in the boxcars during that 25-mile journey. Once they arrived at Capas, they were faced with another nine-mile march to Camp O'Donnell. Even at the final destination of the camp, men continued to die at the rate of 30 to 50 per day. The entire journey took each prisoner from 5 to 12 days, and it took three weeks to relocate all of the prisoners from Mary Leaves to Camp O'Donnell. We will never be certain of the exact number of people killed on the death march of Bataan. It is not known how many U.S. and Filipino soldiers were killed in the final Japanese offensive. Also, a great number of prisoners successfully escaped during the march, particularly the Filipinos who could blend in more easily with their civilian compatriots. The best estimates are that of the 12,000 American soldiers caught on the Bataan Peninsula, about 650 died during the march. Of the 66,000 Filipino troops, 5 to 10,000 died during the forced march. On May 6th, Corregidor fell and all of the Philippines came under Japanese control. Next week, we will conclude the tale of two trails by looking at what happened to the Cherokee once they arrived in Oklahoma, and what happened to the POWs and the Japanese after their arrival at Camp O'Donnell. We will also analyze the similarities and differences between the two forced marches and why forced removals happen. Until then, keep your ears pinned and your tail taut. (laughs) 